Okay, well, good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events this evening. And today we have Zoya Stage. Did I get that correct, Zoya? Zoya. Yes. And uh, she's going to be talking about her brand new book, Getaway, and Barbara's holding a copy there as well. And Zoya was kind enough to sign a batch of books for us, but they're dwindling rapidly. Um, so I'm going to go, and here's a, a cool little bookmark too with each book. I'll go ahead and put a link uh, if you'd like to buy one of the remaining copies in the comments field. And also, if you have questions for Zoya, go ahead and put them in, and I'll emerge uh, whenever I'm summoned uh, to ask any of your questions. So anyway, over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Patrick. I just love the way he does that. It's so it's like there's a trapdoor and Zoom, like a stage trapdoor, which he just peers into and then he comes back. So it's great. So let me raise a glass to you. Um, thank well, you thank so you. much for joining us. This is our first conversation with Zoya, who is the author of two earlier books, uh, Baby Teeth and Wonderland. <laughs> um, Baby Teeth was one of the most anticipated books of 2018. I mean, if you look it up, you will see there's like columns of people who are excited about it. And um, I can see, sorry, that you, it says in your bio that you're a former filmmaker, which is certainly true. I can see it in this book because there's a lot of visual, very visual scenes in it. But you have a penchant for the dark and suspenseful. I love that. <laughs> which I think is an understatement. <laughs> So since we didn't get a chance to talk to you about Baby Teeth, which I remember was a really frightening book, um, why don't you say a few words about Baby Teeth before we move on to Getaway? Sure. Um, Baby Teeth is about a mute seven-year-old girl, and her mom has been homeschooling her because the girl has been very disruptive in schools. And uh, the daughter's father, the mother's husband, has been a little bit oblivious to the dynamics in the family. And so when Suzette starts reporting that Hannah's behavior is getting worse and worse, and she really thinks something is wrong with their daughter, the husband doesn't believe her. Um, but ultimately it really becomes clear to Suzette that her daughter wants to kill her. And then the family really has to figure out how to deal with this very disturbed child. Wow. Well, if that doesn't hook you in, what will? Um, you know, it's an interesting thing. Back in the day when I um, was doing a lot of legal stuff, because in my past, I read the law and did a lot of trial work and so forth. But, but what you really learn in a family dynamic, if there is a child who is handicapped, who's injured, who is um, disturbed, whatever it is, the whole family ends up revolving around that child. And it's difficult for the parents, it's hard for the mother, as you point out, terrifying actually for the mother, but it's also horrendous for siblings um, who, you know, because all of the family attention inevitably focuses upon this one child trying to hold the family together, hold the child together and so forth. And um, I often think that, um, I think Jody Picole wrote a really good book about it years and years ago about two sisters and one of them had leukemia or thing. It was a fatal oh, blood disorder. Do you remember that? I and the, the other both. sister my was- My sister's keeper? Yes, exactly. The other my sister- keeper. I'm sorry, what? I think it was called My Sister's Keeper. <clears throat> yeah, right. And I don't want to give away the ending, but, but basically the healthy sister was being groomed um, to supply blood for the unhealthy child. And you know, the dynamics of all of that and the ethical questions, did the parents have the second child just in order to provide a donor um, for the ill child? And what are the rights of the ill child, if any, and so forth? Um, really complicated, but but you're in baby teeth, she's alone, right? She doesn't have any yes, siblings. She's, she's an only child. I thought that would be a little bit simpler <clears throat> given how complicated the family dynamics were going to be because I did want to try to depict how a family would realistically have to deal with a child like that because that's where where for me a lot of bad seed stories had not quite fulfilled my expectations as I wanted to see I want to see you know what would the family do what were the medical options or legal options or what might they have to do and I mean it happens in real life. There are children who are very 
severely mentally ill who pose a threat to members of the family, and it is very hard for the parents to get help. In baby teeth, perhaps as it is in, in movies in a certain way, the family gets help probably quite a bit easier than, than families in real life. But you know, you can't have a book go on for a thousand pages while the family tries to find medical people to take them seriously. But I know it's a very real problem. Well, you know, it comes up, um, for example, with, with some of the serial shooters or other things and, you know, and, and everybody always says, well, what was wrong with the parents? I think that was particularly true with the school shooting back in the East, you know, where the mother was killed and all. And you, and you look at um, how, she, how she interacted with the boy and, you know, ask yourself, what would you do um, in, a, in a case like that happened with the Gabby Giffords case here in Arizona? You know, the first question that is often asked is, you know, where were the parents? Why didn't they do something about that? But as you say, it's not always an option. And it's really complicated. I, I mean, one of the things that the family and baby teeth struggles with, which I could believe would be a problem in other families, is actually understanding the degree to which it's a problem, because it I think it could be hard to accept just how seriously ill your child might be. And it might be a lot easier to come up with various excuses and try to rationalize various things or just decide to homeschool the child and uh, to actually have to admit and understand, confront and then deal with the fact that your child cannot function with other human beings has to be incredibly hard for people to really face. You know, it, it, it was an international bestseller. I can certainly see why that it would resonate. Sophie Hanna wrote a book similar to that, the name of which I can't remember. Not totally similar, but her first book dealt with a, a child who might be a threat to parents. So, I mean, it's, it's a universal, and it's not, you know, native to any particular country, but I was interested and I've already forgotten it, but you were nominated for an award for the book by, am I right thinking it was one of the horror writing um, Yes, it was. I was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award, right. which was given by the Horror Writers Association. And I thought that was interesting, you know, that, that it would have been, um, the horror writers would have um, flocked to it. And I've been having some interesting discussions with Jane Ann Krentz and Jane T. Ellison, who write very different kinds of books. But we've been exploring the rise of the Gothic, which I said a year or so ago was going to be the next big thing. And I think it has been, and there, there are aspects of um, the horror genre that the Gothic genre, you know, they can often be confused. And when I first picked up Getaway and read some of the, cause you know, they comes with stuff on the back, advanced reading copy to tell you what you should think about the book. Generally, I ignore that, but in this particular case, I happened to notice it. And so I was reading, going into it thinking, is this a supernatural thriller? Is this a, novel? Is this a horror novel? Um, is this a book about female friendship? Is this a psychological thriller? Is this an adventure story? Is it a survival story? Is it a travel log in the Grand Canyon? <laughs> and then I recognized it was all of those things. And you know, do you do you like that? Do you like writing a book that doesn't fit in any particular category but embraces all kinds of themes? It's it's a little bit unintentional. Um, how I perceive my stories is that they're psychological suspense. And I feel like that is the connective tissue between Baby Teeth and Wonderland and Getaway. The external situations in all of the stories are very, very different. But what the characters have to process in order to deal with their situation is very internal and very psychological. And that's true even for an adventure thriller like Getaway, it's still very much Imogen psychoanalyzing herself, the people that she's with to try to figure out the situation. And I know it, it causes a certain amount of confusion in terms of what is the genre of my books. Um, but yeah, in my, in my mind, it, they're so character oriented. And in order to really delve into different bizarre experiences, and to really see how characters would process that, I need very different experiences. And so I think that's part of why they seem very different externally. Um, but yeah, no, I've been surprised sometimes by 
the different genres that people have called my books. I was never expecting Baby Teeth to be considered a horror novel. And that kind of like launched this idea that I'm a horror writer. I didn't necessarily consider Getaway to be a horror novel either, but I think one of the things that has happened in horror is that the the genre has really expanded. Yeah. And you know, it's not just supernatural and werewolves and vampires anymore that people are acknowledging that the things that frighten you in your real life and the scary things that you experience and those psychologically disturbing things that that can all be part of horror. You're right. Um, first place, let me say, I'm not interested in genre labels at all. We have one file at the Poison Pen, it's called fiction. And you know, awesome. so we don't, we don't worry about that. But um, what I was interested in is the way people were, because, you know, before the book publishes, there's an attempt to drum up interest and, you know, sell it to people, so to speak. And assigning labels to it is one way that you do that. You know, if you like, if you like horror, if you like Stephen King, then, you know, you will like Zoya Stage, stage sorry, I keep wanting to say Stage, stage um, and, you know, so it, it doesn't really mean anything other than you're trying to connect with um, potential readers in some fashion. Um, I, I, I'm myself really a fan of the Gothic. I mean, we can go all the way back to Walpole and the Castle of Otranto. We could talk about Poe and the Fall of the House of Usher. You know, we, Stephen King is, you know, kind of the, you know, go-to person at the moment. We have Joe Hill, we have Peter Straub, we have Michael Carita, who is actually bifurcated. He's a uh, fellow um, Hachette author, bifurcated his career between straight crime and the more supernatural, for example. Preston and Child, their new um, Agent Pendergast, who's kind of a Sherlock Holmes for our time. Um, it's, a, it's got a bunch of, they've always had a bit of a supernatural element into it. And yet Pendergast is, is super rational. And so it's interesting, you know, the way they try to get it together. So um, I, I found that your combination here was, was fascinating, but basically I forgot to say that, that this book essentially also was a coming of age story in a sense that Imogen, who has two traumas that she has to deal with, you know, has to, in the end, decide whether she is going to remain paralyzed or um, by the traumas that she's endured or whether she's going to somehow find enough strength to go on. And you set that up with an interesting prologue, um, which is, um, was it, um, you're from Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Where, where is Imogen? She's in Pittsburgh too when this happened? She's in Pittsburgh, she's in Squirrel Hill in my neighborhood where I am. So, so yeah, that, um, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting happened here a couple of years ago, and that does did serve as sort of the inspiration for one of the experiences that Imogen had. Um, she wasn't in the building when the shooting happened, but she was approaching the building and she heard the gunfire inside the synagogue and she froze and ran off and hid in a bush. and. She has carried this incredible guilt with her ever since then that she should have done something. And even though she knows it's not logical, what could she have done against a gunman? It's just something that really haunts her. So that it sort of propels the story forward because then her sister Beck wants to help her get out of this funk that she's in of being such a complete recluse and devises this trip to the Grand Canyon as part of that. But yes, I do work in a lot of little details from my own life. I just, I can't help it. I find writing to be extremely therapeutic and I think I work through some of my own crap by making really messed up characters and having them deal with it. Well, I, I liked your authentic Pittsburgh touch of them going to have tea at the Frick um, because most people think the Frick is only in New York on Fifth Avenue and whatever it is, 72nd Street. And, and I, I do love that Frick, but I've also been um, in the Frick the original and older, really Victorian frick in um, in Pittsburgh, and it is indeed a place where you know you would go to tea to celebrate various rites of passage and all the rest of it. So I like the fact that that you put that in there, you know, to um, to kind of ground us 
in the place because landscape in this book um, is really an essential part of the story. You know, you, you, I mean, I, let's see, Imogene's sister, Beck, is, is a doctor, right? right. She's also right. a lesbian who's expecting a baby uh, with right. her, well, with her partner. Um, they're going to be a family, so to speak. Um, and, and Beck lives in Flagstaff in Arizona, right? Right. So yes. right there, um, you're kind of on the threshold of the south rim of the Grand Canyon. It's not very far from Flagstaff. You can go west to Williams and go north. You can take the Grand Canyon Express or you can drive. If you go up um, the highway to the east, you can come into the canyon from the east on your way up to Monument Valley. Both of those go to the south rim. And for those of you who've never been to the Grand Canyon, it's a big ditch. So if you want to go to the north rim, you actually can't get there, except you have to make a very, very long drive way up, go around east and go way up north and then drive way down south till you get to the, um, to the north rim. And it's only open uh, for a few months of the year, although with climate change, God knows how that will go. Um, but anyway, um, brave people, not myself, because I have never done this. Um, have you actually been in it? So yeah, I meant to ask you that. Yes, I've um, been backpacking in the Grand Canyon four times. Oh. Uh, it was the thing I did with my family when I was younger. My sister, somewhat like Beck, has probably done at least 20 trips, and she did a number of solo trips. My dad did numerous, numerous trips. And actually, it different times in our lives, never all together as a family, but all of us had lived in Flagstaff at least briefly at some point. Wow, well, there you Just are. I mean, like, <laughs> and you know, people think of Arizona as being desert and, you know, they're looking at um, the Spanish influences in Tucson, which is much further south, um, and Phoenix, which is rapidly turning into Beverly Hills or, or Scottsdale anyway is, so we're losing our Arizona touch. Uh, but we're high desert, but Flagstaff is actually up um, in the mountains. It's over 7,000 feet. It has a couple of big volcanoes um, that are very high, 11 or 12,000 feet. It's a ski resort. There's, um, you know, lots of aspen, lots of pine. It's completely different than the Arizona most people think of. And the Grand Canyon is up on that. The Colorado Plateau, which um, goes across Utah, Arizona, over to New Mexico was, as I understand the geology from my last trip to the Grand Canyon, where the ranger kindly explained it all to us, um, all rose. I mean, the Colorado Plateau was a whole lot of striated rock that rose. And so instead of being uh, tilty and you know having striations that are diagonal and whatever it is, it's up. So the Grand Canyon has cut down through, almost like you're cutting down through a cake. And you can mm -hmm. see all the different layers of rock, it's, a, it's an absolute glimpse into eons of geology, but it makes it um, fabulous for hiking because you get to descend actually from today way down into time. Was that fun? Did you enjoy doing that? Yeah, you know, long before I ever started backpacking, my dad was backpacking and he would bring home rocks. I should have brought it with me because I have them downstairs, but one of the things that he brought me was a piece of Vishnu schist which is literally billions of years old. I mean, it's like half the age of the earth. So I was very interested in, in geology before I ever went to the canyon because I had this rock that was like 2 billion years old. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It was one of the real challenges in writing the book. It's like, I know in the most superficial way, everybody knows what the Grand Canyon is, but to really describe it, yeah. I mean, I think it's really indescribable. So it was really a challenge to try to find the right kind of words and imagery so that people would paint pictures in their head of what the experience was like, because it is really, really hard to describe. Probably one of the biggest challenges I've had as a writer is to try to convey the magnitude of this place with just the limitations of English was <laughs> a challenge. Right. Well, it's called grand for a reason. Yes. <laughs> it's really huge. And I had an interesting discussion sorry, with um, an English um, a, um, Oxford Dunn who wrote a book 
outside, he said, uh, actually his expertise is economics, but he wrote a book about gardening in England, the great English gardens and what economic engines there are. And as part of that, he brought forth um, some plants from the 18th century that one of the great landscape gardeners had drawn for one of these big country houses. And it, it was drawn as though the man were in an airplane looking down. And yet you recognize that until flight, nobody could do that. Yeah, you didn't have that perspective. How interesting. Exactly. I was fascinated with that. But then it made me realize that for my 50th birthday, my brother, who had a pilot's license in a small plane, his present to me was to fly me from Scottsdale and fly me over the Grand Canyon, oh. both directions. And I thought, it's only if you're in the air over it but you're not so high in a supersonic, you know, in today's jets, because then you're too high that you can really even embrace the magnitude of the canyon. Um, and it, you know, they don't, it, there are all kinds of restrictions on it. I'm not even sure you can do that anymore. You know, there's been a couple of accidents, air drafts, whatever. And actually this year, there have been in a surprising last couple of years, surprising number of deaths, some of them murder um, at the canyon where people have either um, gone missing because they went hiking. There's a couple of instances where people were encouraged to like back up for, in we'll get to Instagram here because that's part of your story, backing up, you know, for a great photo op and backing up right over the edge. Um, and then, you know, people who've had adverse reactions to not strong enough to make the climb out, whatever it is. So they actually have a whole, um, kind of medical emergency medical center at the South Rim, you know, to try to, to deal with all that. So um, oftentimes people are unprepared for the magnitude of the canyon, but also the dangers of trying to, um, trying to be casual, you know, being casual about hiking right. into it. So I like the fact that in your book, um, you know, when after the horrible opening, horrendous opening scene, um, in Pittsburgh with the shootout, we're next in Flagstaff, where I think your phrase was, it looked like a bomb had gone off in the sister, Beck, the doctor at Imogene's sister's house, with all of the stuff that the three women involved were assembling sensibly to try to tackle this. So why don't you tell us about the other women? We've talked a little about uh, Imogen. Tell us about Beck and about, um, trying to remember, what's her name? Tilda. Tilda is there. Shoulder, right. Yes, yeah, so Imogen, Imogen is a writer. Um, she's in her mid thirties. She and her sister and Tilda all went to high school together. And Beck, as you said, is a, is a doctor. She's a general practitioner. She's married. She's about to have her first child. And she's very much a person who likes to fix things and has the expectation that she can fix things. So she's like very straightforward about how she thinks. And then their friend Tilda, she has become an influencer. She launched a somewhat strange career after, you know, waiting tables and doing that kind of thing and wanting to be a singer. And then she got her big break on American Idol. And that happened many years before the start of the story, but she, I think, finished 11th in her season and she was able to use that to like just keep going in the public eye. So she's become quite well known and much to Imogen's chagrin, she's also writing a book, though it's a nonfiction book and Imogen has some jealousy issues towards Tilda in addition to the fact that there was an incident in Tilda's life from when they were in their first year in college. And in the book, it's just referred to as the thing but it's something that in recent years, Imogen has become more conscious of in terms of how it affected her life. And Beck has become more conscious after reading one of Imogen's books about how that event affected her life. And so Beck has this idea, again, that she can fix everything and everyone and have Imogen and Tilda confront each other and deal with this situation from the past. And then they can be best friends again and everything will be fine. That's her idea of it anyway. Um, needless to say, there's not as much time on the trip for bonding and dealing with all of their stuff from the past as they thought there would be, but they do manage in their own way. I'd say it probably ends up being much more of a bonding experience 
because of the trip going badly than it might have been if the trip had actually gone well. Oh yeah, no, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm fascinated with the whole idea that influencers are a profession. I mean, you know, it just it just blows me away. I do the Instagram for the bookstore, um, but otherwise I've avoided all personal social media. And I've been I've been interested to see that when I started it, I thought it would be just all, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do my part. The rest of the staff does other, you know, they do Facebook, they do Twitter, whatever. And I thought, surely I could do like one thing you know, to, to do this. And I thought it was going to be like all books all the time, all about the store. And what I've learned is that what people like the most are not just the pictures of our brand new puppies, which we adopted on National Dog Day, puppy videos, way out why the book you know just totally do but but people really love you know um the travel pictures that because i do a lot of that um they even like you know pictures of the uh, arizona gardens with the cacti and all we have a particularly beautiful garden and the whole bit and um that that it isn't it isn't really just the books by a lot in fact sometimes the books are the least popular thing and all this other stuff, you have to have kind of a blend. Now, does it does it have any actual financial benefit for the bookstore? I am not sure. We don't have an Instagram store. And if we ever set one up, which right now, since we're way over our heads with the amount of business we have, I don't want to, I don't want to add that to the mix because we just love it. Um, the only way I can imagine that I could we could determine if Instagram were actually an economic uh, tool, you know, social media tool for the bookstore would be to set up a store because there's no other way to measure it. So why am I doing it? Is the question I often ask myself, you know, why am I doing this? You know, I, it, I don't want to do it for me. And I'm not at all clear that it's a particular benefit for the poison pen. Um, in a way, it's a communication tool. So I can't go from that to think about being an influencer as a full-time job. I just can't wrap my head around it. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it, I remember a few years ago when I first started hearing the word more and more often. And you know, originally I think I just thought of people like Paris Hilton and the Kardashians of, of like people who I thought were kind of famous for no reason, no offense to them, but what did they do but be famous? And I, kind of feel like there are some influencers who may be along those lines but then again there are you know i know like in the bookstagram community there are people who have hundreds of thousands of followers yeah. their opinions and the books that they promote they do actually make a difference so and i know that like once people have i don't know how many followers you have to have i certainly don't have them. i don't know if it's a hundred thousand or a million but they do see financial benefit from it. You know, they get sponsorships and they do various deals and they, people can make a lot of money. Um, I think it's probably something that younger people probably know more about because they lived in a time when that was kind of normal and maybe it's easier for them to process how to do it and how it works. I have no clue how you attract those kind of followers and really influence influence what somebody thinks or what they're supposed to like but I mean I probably do it for the same reason that you do is I you know I feel a certain obligation to be out there and to share a certain amount of stuff um, and at least for me I do feel like it does help me connect to some individual readers and people who I feel friendlier with now that it's like I've seen them for a long time and I've seen pictures of people's kids in their home library and all their stuff. So in the modern world, it's like social media has become this far distant way of becoming, I, I know the word friend is different than what it used to be because you don't have to know a person in real life anymore to call someone a friend, but I'm trying to accept it. But, you know, if, it's, if Instagram really goes the route of TikTok, I'm drawing the line there because I'm not doing TikTok. So. Well, I've so far resisted TikTok and Book Talk um, because you know. I, I anyway, I th I think it's probably a, a younger thing. What what I do think 
um, is there are certainly some positives from it. Although I would never have considered it as a career option. But the negative side of it is that it tends, if people, everybody wants to be the hero of his own story. And what, what's happened is that the platform allows every single person now to basically do that, you know, to put a story up and be the centerpiece of it. We really see that back in before times when live people came to the bookstore to, you know, to meet authors and we had live signings, which I hope we will be able to go back to. But gradually we could see a shift between people who wanted to either talk to the author or, you know, just get an autographed book to everybody with a phone wanting a photo so they could rush home and put it on social media. And, you know, part of it may have been celebratory, but a lot of it was just, you know, I was there and you weren't. And so what happens is, you know, there's um, a lot of um, people have a hard time comparing their ordinary lives to these more glamorous Instagram lives. There can be rancor, you know, there can be jealousy. And that I thought was a di was a long way around to say that this is a dynamic in your book that Tilda, who has become an influencer and who has acquired a six-figure book deal, would really arouse resentment in Imogen, who is an author. Um, and, you know, did Tilda get a book deal just because she's famous for being famous? Or, you know, or is it based on talent and there's Imogen? And so I think, I think that there are some definite negatives to, to Instagram, probably Facebook as well. I don't do Facebook, so I'm, I'm spared that. Patrick does it. And when he comes back, he can weigh in here. But it is a thread in your book, certainly, that um, Tilda's success as an Instagrammer and an influencer has caused a, a rift in the fabric of this friendship. Well, you know, all of social media has created a very strange dynamic in the world. You know, this idea of likes and popularity and having it not really be based on anything. And, you know, from Imogen's perspective of Tilda, she finds that all incredibly superficial and a little bit ridiculous. Right. Um, but then also from Imogen's perspective, you know, Imogen is the one who is a hermit, who really, if she could be an influencer, that would be the ideal job for her. Um, <laughs> Because yeah, yes, she could just take pictures at home and post stuff online and just live behind her computer. It would be great. But, you know, here's Tilda, who is like, didn't initially start out being successful at everything, but kind of became successful for everything that she did, which, you know, for Imogen, it's been a much, much longer road. And I know Imogen thinks of herself as being more deserving um, because of having paid her dues in a very real way. But yeah, social media has kind of completely changed the idea of paying dues in a field. It's like, if you can figure out the game and you have something that people are attracted to and they'll tune into, you could be anybody. You could be anybody and you could become somebody in the modern world, which it's just, it is very, very different than how the world used to be. It really is. So you have, um, I thought, a very telling moment in the book when Imogen, you know, other people are doing things, but I'm not Imogen, sorry, Tilda, her, she's just taking photos, you know, because that's what she does. You have to have this enormous fodder for Instagram um, of taking photos. And, um, you know, it, it, it definitely distorts the dynamic between the three of them, certainly as compared to when they first met in college, which was far enough back that none of this was as big a dynamic um, as is turned out to be. So um, the doctor um, is probably the most grounded of the three of them in this whole book. I mean, she may be um, a bit unconventional. I mean, she's married to a woman and they're having a child and so we're not unconventional, but you know, she's, but she's, she's okay with all that, you know, um, and she's living in a time when you can do that um, without, you know, any sort of necessity to hide it or censure or whatever it is you know you can have um our ideas of family have shifted um our ideas of um who can be parents and how to be parents and so forth is has shifted and so she's really 
as you, you know, portray her, she's really the grounded one in this, hoping that this trip to nature, this descent into the wilderness and all, will take Imogen, who has trauma, and we won't talk about the other trauma because it's part of the story, but two traumas to deal with, PTSD for more than one event, and Tilda, um, who is um, of Spanish heritage, so, you know, yet another, another part of the mix. Um, hoping to, to sort of bring them back together. And, you know, in a way I feel sorry for, for um, the doctor in the sense that her great idea goes wrong, but it's not her fault. So how much can we talk about whether, um, you know, do you, want, do you want to preview how that happens or should we let the reader figure out that when they descend into the canyon, something unexpected and terrible happens? Yeah, I'm always, I'm always so torn about how much to say about it. What I've started doing since promoting the book is telling a story from my personal life as, as what part of the inspiration was for the book because it doesn't give away anything in the book because it's something that happened in my personal life. So, so when I was 18, my family and I, when our whole family was still together, so it's my mom, my dad, my sister, and me, and we did a six day backpacking trip in the Grand Canyon. And we were spending each night at a different place. And one of those nights we were spending at a very remote inner canyon called Salt. And it was just this little teeny tiny butte, kind of the middle of nowhere with this incredible view. And there was only one designated camping spot at Salt. And we had the permit. So, you know, we were permitted to stay there for the night. And while we were setting up our stuff, this guy comes by. And my memory of him, because my memory is always very weird. So I imagined him when I was like thinking back on it. My memory of him was just so like something out of a book or a movie. You know, I had, you know, this sense of danger about this man. And I remember he was carrying a gun and all this crazy stuff. So I asked my sister if she remembered, you know, when we had stayed at Salt and the guy came by and she said, yeah, he had said he had just gotten out of prison. And then I asked my dad about it because I knew he would remember everything. His memory for the Grand Canyon is like amazing. Um, and I asked him, you know, can you tell me, you know, about what happened when the guy came by at Salt? And he said, yes, the guy had said that he had just gotten out of prison and he was walking around the canyon by himself. He did not have a gun, <laughs> emphatically did not have a gun. But the guy proceeded to just tell us this story, just very conversationally. He told us that he had been walking around the canyon by himself, and at some point he had crossed paths with a lone female ranger, and he had realized that he could have picked up a rock and bashed her in the head, and no one would have ever known. And my dad at that point told me that he started, he started looking for a rock because you know, was he going to need a weapon? We didn't know what this guy was going to do, because that's not a very normal thing to tell people in a conversational tone. Um, but in, in our story, the guy just walked on. We never saw him again and really never had to think about him again um, until I started thinking about novels to write. And it was a pretty obvious starting place to think, you know, what would happen if, if a group of people were in the canyon and they met someone who was not quite right, who did not walk on. So. Got it. That's a very good summation. You know, the interesting part of that, actually, sorry, is that you don't know whether the guy, whether he just made that up, you know, back in the day. I mean, he could easily have just been, you know, some accountant, you know, who decided he would feel macho by telling people he was out of prison and whatever, because you know, how would you, how would you ever check out his story? Right. Yeah. I mean, we never knew his name. We never knew anything else about him, but, you know, I have to say we, we crossed paths with a lot of people in the Grand Canyon and, you know, typically people in the Canyon are very friendly. They're, they're of a sort and people always exchange a little bit of information. They always talk about where they're from, but we had never crossed paths with anybody who had a story like that. So it was definitely very odd. It definitely made me think twice. Obviously that planted itself in my subconscious to mull over for many, many years before I did anything with it. But I think he was 
just being himself. I think he was telling us the truth that he had gotten out of prison and that he had had that thought. I don't think he necessarily considered it wrong or strange that he had had that thought. Well, if he'd just gotten out of prison for him, you know, it was all probably normal, you know, kind of a, a way of life. And there are certainly instances, I think, particularly in Yosemite, there are instances where people in national parks have, you know, um, there have been crimes committed. Rangers have, you know, law enforcement training and so forth. So, you know, you're out in the wilderness. It's not just the bears that are dangerous. Um, right. So, you know, not unusually speaking. In any case, uh, what you really wanted to do was set up a very testing situation to see how these three women would fare individually and as a team um, and whether their friendship was going to help them or whether the fractures in it would divide them and hurt them and how would they come out if they come out on the other side. And we're not gonna tell you how that worked out because that would sort of spoil the book. Um, but it comes back to that interesting mix that I mentioned at the beginning. There are so many different elements to this book that um, I think, you know, just call it a novel. I mean, it's fiction, you get to make things up um, and explore stories. It's definitely character driven. It definitely needs this particular landscape or a similar landscape. I mean, you could have picked not necessarily the Grand Canyon. I mean, you know, it's possible they could have gone to some other um, wilderness, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad you picked Arizona. <laughs> Otherwise, we might not actually be talking about this. So what is your, what's your plan next? This is your third book. Um, I'm assuming that you're going to carry on like Imogen and think about writing more books. So you got any thoughts about a new book? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in 2022, I know there hasn't been a formal announcement for this yet, but I realize I've been telling everybody on these events, so, oh well. Um, I'm, I'll be publishing my first novella in 2022. It's a little bit off brand for me, um, but it's a project I'm really passionate about. It's, it's sort of a dark fairy tale. I call it a wary tale, <laughs> but it's also a parable as I think fairy tales should be. Um, and then I also, I recently finished it was really hard to write during the pandemic. It was such a weird year, but I did recently finish um, a first draft of a new novel and I showed it to my agents and they really loved it. So, so that's just starting. It's, we're a little too early in that for me to really describe it, except to say that it's some mother-daughter story, but unlike Baby Teeth, it's an adult mother-daughter story. Wow. Well, with even more you. creepiness than baby teeth, maybe. So you really do tend towards the nightmarish and the dark some of the time. I love I it. I right. And, you know, you're right in sync with, you know, the pandemic. Lots of writers have, have said, well, that's not true. What, what we normally hear, because this question comes up with almost all of the author discussions we do, is that the pandemic has made it difficult to write or the pandemic has created so much downtime that people have been even more productive. And I think, you know, there's, there's really no way to predict how any one person will react to the to lockdowns and to, you know, a kind of hovering sense of danger all the time or just isolation. Writers, I think, in many ways are better prepared for isolation than many people. Um, but there's a lot of distraction. Didn't help with the um, political situation, doom scrolling became kind of a way of life. Um, but good for you that you were that um, productive. And I'm delighted to hear you talk about fairy tales because I was, when I was a child, absolutely loved fairy tales. Do you remember like the yellow book of fairy tales and the red book and the blue book and the green book? And maybe, maybe not. Them. You probably are, are um, I'm, I'm older, so I would remember they were collected like that. The fairy tales were basically dark and disturbing. I mean, Disney has given us, I think, on a, a um, sanitized version of an awful lot of fairy tales, but many of them were um, very dark. A lot of them, a lot of them come from Germany where there was lots of forests and beasts and, you know, trolls under bridges and really scary things. Do you know the work of Joanne Harris at all? 
She wrote, she wrote a, a, a major book called Chocolat, which became a great movie with Johnny Depp and Julia Binoche and all. But she has it, always been fascinated with fairy tales and she's written um, several novels or collections of dark fairy tales. And John Connolly who's Irish and um, he's collected at least one book, I think, of Irish fairy tales, you know, which are also on the on the dark side. I've always thought they were they were kind of an interesting Germanic version of Greek mythology, you know, I mean, like Bullfinch's Age of Fables, because if you really mm -hmm. read a lot of the Greek myths, there's some awful bad stuff that really happens in them, but it's kind of blamed on the gods. But I think I think fairy tales were kind of a way for middle Europeans to explain the world in the same way that the Greeks wrote their myths. Um, so what interested you in writing a fairy tale? Um, there were a couple of things. One, you know, maybe this is evident in my second novel, Wonderland, which does have a supernatural element. I really enjoy writing without having any constrictions where I don't have to be constricted by the real world. I can just literally do anything I want and let my imagination go wherever. Um, and I really like that. And the other thing I had heard or read, uh, Philip Pullman had written the introduction for a collection of fairy tales several years ago. And he described fairy tales, at least in terms of their structure as one thing happens and another thing happens. And then another thing happens and another thing happens. And I was very intrigued by that. And I wanted to write something where I was not stopping and doing all of this self-reflection and all of this internal stuff. I wanted to write one thing happens and another thing happens and another thing happens. Um, and I also do like how, you know, a lot of the darker fairy tales are meant to teach you something, yeah. something about the world. And in my story, a young girl has this incredible growth spurt and she keeps growing and growing and clearly she's growing into a giant and it's beyond what anybody can understand. And she doesn't like how her father and the doctors are treating her as a condition. And as in many fairy tales, she runs away and finds herself on this very strange adventure of finding out who she really is, which is a very unexpected thing. And there are some other dark things in there, which made people kind of not want to publish the book, but I finally found a brave publisher. So, so yes, it's sort of, it's the story of a young girl who grows into a giant and discovers who she really is, but it also is kind of a parable for how patriarchy has looked at and treated the female body. So it just let me do something very creative and fun. So I, I would like to read more fairy tales. I'm going to have to write down those authors because I, I may want to write more fairy tales in the future. I do like just being able to run free with my stories and not have any constrictions. I love fairy tales. I think, um, you know, I was, I was lucky because I read so much so fast that when I was even in grade school, I was allowed to read um, because they'd run out of everything else in the library, I was allowed to read Bullfinch's Age of Fable and then to read all these fairy tale collections and, you know, and the Oz books and other things. And, and you know, they're all bridges. Um, they're, they're a world of imagination, but they're also bridges to interpreting life and, you know, making sense out of it if you can. So, you know, um, I feel really fortunate that I had that, that kind of freedom Back when people read without, you know, watching television or because there was no television until I was older, um, it makes a, it makes a it made a real difference. And I, I think kids today don't get as much chance to just have an unfettered imagination. Radio was good for that, too. Radio was wonderful. If you really wanted to scare yourself, you could listen to suspense because, you know, since it was all just voices. You had to imagine everything in your head and you could paint the whole universe of the story, you know, in your own imagination, which is totally different than watching it on television or going to a movie or same thing. Patrick, we probably nattered on enough. Why don't you come out of the deep and join us and give us the benefit of your wisdom? I wouldn't go that far. 
Um, actually, I do have a couple of questions, though. Uh, did you, um, Zoya, did you happen to read uh, John Wesley Powell's uh, ex you know, account of his expedition? I think it was in the 1870s to the Grand Canyon. Right. Um, my dad had that book, and I think I had read some excerpts from it way, way back in the day when I was doing backpacking. Um, I don't think I ever read the entire thing, though. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I guess there's there are quite a few accounts over the years of, uh, and also of mishaps in the Grand Canyon. There have been there have been a number of them. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, I know. Even you know, I haven't been backpacking for decades at this point, but it seemed like every year when we were planning trips, you would still always hear a story of someone falling into the canyon or some sort of catastrophic problem. I mean, it's why Indian Gardens exists, which is on the trail, Bright Angel Trail, partway between the rim and um, Bright Angel Wet Campground, because so many tourists would think that, that, that it was a day hike and then get into problems and realize they couldn't get out or they didn't have enough food or water or equipment. So yeah, people have underestimated how difficult it is to do things in the canyon for a very long time. Right, yeah, we, I never actually, I was just thinking about that. I, I never actually made it all the way down to the bottom. We went on one of our, you know, uh, Griswold family vacations uh, and we ended up there and we made it halfway down, came back up. But it was cool, really, really stunning place, obviously. Um, yeah, I was also going to ask you a little bit about um, about PTSD, you know, and, and writing about PTSD. And, um, you know, it seems like collectively as a society, we're all suffering from PTSD in some way over the last year and a half, two years. Um, but can you talk about maybe researching some of that material and without giving away spoilers, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I do believe that as a society, we suffer from PTSD. And I think it's it started long, long before the pandemic. I think the nature of the wars that this country has had, the gun violence, poverty, there are so many ways for, for trauma to manifest in people's lives and it can become a very repetitive process. I read a very interesting book a couple of years ago called Waking the Tiger. Um, that really talked about PTSD, both in terms of a personal experience of it and how it manifests in a community. And I was very, very intrigued by that. And part of why I was reading it, you know, my story is not Imogen's story, but I have my own experience with PTSD. And, you know, it was, as I alluded to before, you know, I do work out some of my own issues by writing about them. And I did want to explore that and especially, I wanted to explore this idea with Imogen that, you know, even though she has suffered these issues in her life, it hasn't made her a person who doesn't have dreams or who's not capable of doing things. I know it was one of the things I had talked about with my editor when, you know, I was working on revisions for the book and she had certain ideas about making Imogen a little bit more pathetic. I'll just use the word pathetic. And I was very resistant to that because I was like, everyone around us is suffering from PTSD, or at least the majority of people. And they're ordinary people who have families and jobs, and they're not acting in some sort of overt way that you would know what they're dealing with inside. But I do believe that so many people really are dealing with something very difficult and have experienced things that they don't really talk about in public or maybe haven't figured out how to process it completely for themselves. So it was something I wanted to be sensitive to while I was writing this book um, because I know it, it manifests differently in different people, but I always wanted Imogen to be a person who could come back from her situation. And actually, hopefully, hopefully it's okay that I say this, but I got a message from a reader last night saying that she had, she, I won't say what had happened to her, but she had had a very specific traumatic thing happen to her and she had just read Getaway and she was so touched by how the book dealt with it. And she, 
she felt so seen to have a character who can overpower and come back and regain her power after having suffered trauma. So needless to say, that was incredibly meaningful to me that somebody reached out and was so touched by my book and by that aspect of the book. So I hope other people, even if they don't send me a message about it, but just if they have some issue in their life that they've not quite known what to talk about or not quite processed fully that they, if they read Imogen's story, that maybe they'll feel a little more powered themselves about what their own possibilities are. You know, and as you say, you can never assume to know what someone else is going through, you know, or what, you know, it's fascinating. I'm going to add a note here, which is one of the few benefits of aging is that if you do it well, as I hope I am, one of the things you have to learn is to forgive yourself for those things that you could have done differently that you might have not done well. Um, and that I think that's part of PTSD too. It's part of Imogen's problem um, in a way is that she needs to learn to forgive herself for her cowardice, let's say, or her lack of agency at the synagogue shooting. The fact that she ran and hid, um, mm -hmm. that's, that is, a trauma for her, but she also needs to learn to forgive herself for doing it. And no, I think she needs to forgive herself on multiple levels. Yeah. There are so many instances that happen, you know, as a result of traumatic events where people have regrets or blame themselves for some aspect, even if it is just, why didn't I do something differently? Um, but obviously you can't fully heal until you can can forgive yourself for those things. I think accepting other very traumatic events that are from the outside can be a little bit harder if it makes you a bit more tentative about dealing with the world. And that's something that Imogen is dealing with also. Um, but yeah, no, it's really complex. I highly recommend Waking the Tiger if anybody is interested in the subject of PTSD, both personally and as a community. It sounds like uh, the title Getaway is one of those titles that does double, triple duty in a lot of different ways. Um, do you think that it would lend itself to, uh, to the silver screen or to a, a film if it was done right? I do. It would have to be done right. My, when I first was thinking about it, and like my sister read the book and she's like, oh yeah, this would make a great movie. And I was like, but how would they shoot it? Because I don't think you can shoot anything like that on the trails in the Grand Canyon. But then my sister being much more knowledgeable of Arizona than I am. And she started rattling off the name of all these places like, oh, they could shoot it here and there. And so it's like with movie magic, they could probably fake the Canyon trails. So that wouldn't be the big issue. For me, the big issue would be to maintain the complexity of the relationships and how no one is just black and white or clear cut and how some of their alliances kind of move back and forth. Like that would be more important to me than, um, I don't know, any kind of big action scenes or anything like that. Right. Have you been um, to the Canyon de Chez by any chance? I have, yes. Yeah, that's really amazing too. And it, yes, yes. it's funny how um, a lot of those places, we, my wife and I love to go up to the Hopi mesas, you know, up there. And um, we just got back from a little trip up to that part of the world. And I don't know, there is this, I, I hesitate to say spooky, but some of those spots, there is some sort of vibe, you know, a, a resonance that comes out of the landscape. And it's hard to really describe it, but um are there any other locations that kind of speak to you in that way? You know, I'm probably not well traveled enough, but definitely in the places in the in Arizona that I've yeah. been to. And part of it is knowing that people had lived there. Because you know, there were people who the Anasazi had lived in the Grand Canyon at one point and at Canyon de Chez, and they still have you know, the handprints on the walls. And you know, it's like people had lived there. Families had lived their ordinary family lives there. So there, I think there is always this sense of a presence of past people. So I'm sure if I had 
traveled more, I would have experienced some of that in other places too. Maybe someday I'll get a chance. I don't know. And also places where, you know, very traumatic events have occurred, yeah. you know, battlefields, going to Gettysburg or go to, you know, uh, Little Bighorn or places like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I do actually have a customer or a, a question here. Uh, Dustin asks, he says, I'm 80 pages from the end of Getaway and absolutely loving it. Did you base all of the locations on the character's journey on real locations you've been to? It feels so specific and lived in, and that builds the suspense and reality of the perilous situation even more. Yes. Um, well, actually, yes and no. While I've been backpacking in the Grand Canyon four times, I have not been out to Slate and Boucher, which play key roles in the book, but with my dad's help in terms of research, every single place that they are in the Grand Canyon, I tried to write with as much accuracy as possible. And I know like for the sake of fiction, sometimes it could be very easy to be like, oh, well, make up something else so that the characters could do something else. But I didn't want to do that. I really wanted them to work within the confines of what it would actually be like to be in those places in the Grand Canyon. So. So I try to make that as realistic as possible. You guys were talking about uh, fairy tales, or I really think of them as folk tales, you know? Um, it got a lot of crossover there. Uh, are there writers that you admire that kind of meld that into their work? Not to put you on the spot, but I was thinking of, you know, Italo, Italo Calvino and, you know, people like that who've done a lot with. You know, I definitely enjoy books where like they've almost created their own mythology. Um, and now I'm trying to remember the titles that I supposed like the Claire Fuller's first book. Do you know the book I mean, Claire Fuller's first book? What was it called? It will, it will occur to me in 20 minutes. Um, and Carol, Carola DeBell's first book. That was another one where she really created such an interesting kind of post-apocalypse. Well, I guess it's more dystopian sort of mythology. So I do, I do enjoy books that do that, but obviously I'm terrible at recalling what they're called. <laughs> well, on the spot, but yeah. Was it called Unsettled Ground? No, that's her current. That's Claire Fuller's most recent um, one. Bitter Orange? Nope. I was thinking of Dan. Dan our Simmons, Dan Our Simmons. Endless Numbered Days. Our Endless Numbered Days. Yes, that was her first book. Great yes. title. Yes, I know. It's a wonderful title. Yeah, it Dan Simmons. Title. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's handy that we have these little gadgets where we can look up stuff. Normally, Patrick saves me from <laughs> a lack of memory by looking it up and um, using the chat feature. But you know, it's great. I love the fact that we can recommend books by other people when we have these conversations, you know, because I think it's very helpful for readers to um, have an opportunity to get recommendations from authors and see other things. I didn't realize I'd gone quite so dark here. I have to turn on a light. Um, there we go. Yay. Um, it's been a real treat to meet you and to talk to you. Thank you so much. I'm glad the Grand Canyon has brought us together. Yes, it's been very fun, very interesting. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a real pleasure. I'll remind you again that we do have autographed copies of this wonderful book. And since Labor Day weekend is coming right up, it's something that you might want to read. And I hope um, that we'll get a chance to do this again when your next book publishes. So yeah, um, anyway, thanks for joining us. Um, let me thank all of you who are watching it tonight. Um, I apologize for screwing up the time uh, and talking to our public, uh, many of our customers, I said we were at six sometime. I tell you, the hardest part of Zoom is keeping the time down. I mean, just it's a nightmare. I worked out one recently. We're going to do an event with an author in Perth, Australia, and an author in Dublin, Ireland, and we're in the middle. So trying to trying to work out what time it is at two o'clock in Arizona. What time is it in Perth? It's five a.m. I now know that. What time is it in Dublin? It's ten p.m. <laughs> and, you know, trying to get all that together, Zoom has allowed us to do all these wonderful things, you know, and, and bring authors together 
that we would, would never have had a chance to do. But um, occasionally, we really screw it up. So my apologies. What is it, Patrick? One last point. I wanted to ask Zoya, um, is, was Josh, Josh Kendall your editor on this book for Mulholland, or was it? No, actually, Helen O'Hare. OK. Uh, I was just going to ask, have you come up with a soundtrack for the book? It's a serious I question. Into, I know, but it, for me, it would go into this very long, strange conversation about my um, strange relationship with sound, because I very rarely listen to music. I have a very strange thing with sound and disembodied noises. Cool. So no, I don't listen to very much music. So no, I do not have a soundtrack. You know, it's an interesting thing. We've had a number of books and a number of authors who actually have um, Publish the playlist of the music playlist along with the book, you know, to either because it suits the story or yeah. it's the playlist they listen to while they were writing it. Um, but I do find, you know, it's almost as their books are becoming kind of multimedia in a strange way. It's really fascinating. And of course, authors can use their websites too, you know, to, to do that kind of thing, to do outtakes, to do, you know, deleted scenes. Um, you're a filmmaker, so you're definitely familiar with that whole dynamic, right? Yeah, though, I have to say in, in recent years, I have really sort of gone hardcore for writing novels. Um, and I never kept up with all the technology of, of filmmaking. So it's like, well, I have an iPad now, so at least I have iMovie again. But I really otherwise don't have any equipment anymore. But Honestly, my experience is that I can do so much more with writing a novel or writing long fiction than I could ever do trying to make a film because I never had the resources to really make what I ever wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And film is always such a project by committee and writing novels is not so much like that. So yeah, yeah. I'm a hardcore novelist now. You can be the god of your own book, but nonetheless, your career as a filmmaker is responsible, I'm sure, for the very visual quality of lots of your scenes. I think you did a wonderful job in painting, you know, the picture for us um, while we while we read it. So anyway, thank you so much. It's been great. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.